So, hello, my name is Emily Perry um, and I'm from um, Ensemble. And hopefully you're all here to attend the webinar on getting gene and genome data programmatically using the Ensemble REST API. So everything that you're going to need for this course, um, if you go to training.ensemble.org slash events, hopefully this has come up when I last checked, it hadn't come up. Um, oh, here it is. I'll just put that into the, the chat box so that you can get to it. Um, so everything, if you want to kind of follow along the slides, you can do. There's no necessity to do so. But if you want to get a copy of the slides, um, you will see that there. We also have some code that we're going to be um, that I'll be showing you how it works. So if you want to get and that's in a, a Jupyter notebook. And if you want to have the, the copy of that, um, you can find that there as well. So what we have in Ensemble is gene annotation for um, actually over 200 species. Now we have gene trees, um, which involves the, the comparison of all the, the genes to each other. We have um, regulatory data for, for human and mouse. We have variation data. We have a tool for analyzing your own variation data called the VEP. We allow you to display your own data um, and we have data export. Um, and so some of the ways that you can export data is through Biomart, which is a point and click tool. Um, but today we're going to be talking about programmatic access via the APIs. And you can access most of the data um, that's available um, listed up here. This, most of this is accessible via um, these APIs. Now, it is completely open source. Um, so the, the actual code that allows you to access this is freely available if you want to, to take a look at it and um, manipulate it for, for yourself. So we release data um, on a regular basis. This um, refers to quite an old release, but that doesn't matter. So every three months, we will bring out um, new and updated uh, genome assemblies, updates to the software, which includes um, the REST API. We'll carry out um, comparative analysis. We'll bring in um, new variation and regulation data, and we will update our um, interfaces and our APIs to match this. This means that all of our data is versioned. Um, whenever you're using the REST API, you will always be accessing the current version, but it is possible to access previous versions um, as well. And it's a really good idea to take a note of which version um, you're getting data from. So that if you do um, want to, to kind of go back to what you've done and you want to trace back your, your original analysis, you can do that. Um, by going to the relevant archives. So um, you can access these if you just put E dot, whatever number the archive is, um, at the front of any URLs you use with REST, this will take you to the archive. Um, and I'll show you where you can find the current version um, as well in the REST API. So Ensemble is based on a, a data model that kind of matches up with the biology. Um, so biologically, you have DNA um, and that DNA, some of it is transcribed um, into pre-mRNA, um, spliced into mRNA and then translated into protein. Of course, not all of it is translated. So the sort of model, the computational model that underlies this follows the same model. Um, so you have what we call primary features. So a feature is anything that is mapped to the genome. Um, so we have features of exons, uh, um, and a set of these exons makes up a feature called a transcript, and a set of uh, transcripts which share exons make up a feature called a gene. Um, so this matches what we know of the biology as well. There's also the concept of translations. Now translations are not what we call features um, because they don't directly map to the, the genome. They are a, an interpretation of um, another object. Um, and of course, not all transcripts have them. So this translation object is essentially saying for a transcript, where do we have coding sequence? Where do we have untranslated region? And also the um, sequence that is computed on the fly. 
Something to, to be aware of is features always have a defined location with a start and end, where the start of a feature is always the, the smaller number, the most five prime number, which means that when you're looking at genes that are, um, so this example gene on the forward strand, the start of this forward strand gene is the transcription start site because that's the most five prime um, compared to the chromosome. The end is the transcription end because that's the most five prime compared to the chromosome. For this reverse strand gene, the start is the most five prime compared to the chromosome, which is actually the transcription end. Um, and the end of the, of the gene feature is the most three prime, which is actually in, of the chromosome, which in this case is the most five prime of the, the gene. The, the transcription um, start site. So this is something to kind of be aware of. So what is a REST API? REST stands for representational state, state transfer, um, and it describes how systems can communicate with each other. Um, so it's typically over the internet, um, usually over HTTP, usually HTTPS these days, um, and it, create, it provides machine readable data um, so it's completely language agnostic. It doesn't require any particular programming language. You can use any programming language and it allows you to access remote data. So essentially what you're doing with REST API is you're sending a command to um, rest.ensemble.org and it looks like this, HTTP slash rest.ensemble.org slash, and then this data I want is where you define what you actually want to get. And then it sends a message back to you with this data in this structured computer readable format. The Ensemble REST API allows you to access Ensemble databases in a language agnostic um, fashion. We do also have a, a Perl API, which is a bit more extensive. Um, basically, the Perl API allows you to access every single thing in the database, the REST API allows you to access the thing that we think most people want to access. Every so often we come across something that isn't possible and then we can get into the chat as well. For anybody, my computer's trying to get me to have a break. Doesn't want me to stare at my screen. Um, it'll do that again in 20 minutes. I should have turned that off, um, except it's new and I haven't worked out how to do that. Um, so this is rest.ensemble.org. And here we have a documentation of what we call endpoints. Um, so I'm going to talk about endpoints a lot. So I want to labor this point um, a little bit. So um, an endpoint is essentially, so this is the, 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 the um, techie definition. The resource typically refers to some object or set of objects that are exposed at an API endpoint. The endpoint it, by itself is just a reference to a URI that accepts web requests that may or may not be RESTful. So basically, it's a particular kind of output that you can get with a particular input. It's a function that interacts with our database. Um, the endpoint is when we say um, in this, if we go back to this data I want, the endpoint is, and if I'm clicking there, um, is this bit here where you put in, so you say rest.org, and then you say, you kind of specify, and there are different types of data, so you can kind of fill in the gaps um, to say, well, I want to get the sequence of a gene. So there might be a, an endpoint that says sequence, um, and then a bit where you fill in what the gene is. And so we classify that, that sequence slash where you fill in what your gene is as an endpoint. So the full documentation um, of the endpoints is listed here um, online. So the documentation lists all of the endpoints and they're grouped by different functions. Um, the required parameters and the optional parameters. So I'll just quickly go through kind of what these groupings are and the kinds of things um, that you can get. So there are archive endpoints. So I mentioned earlier about using, um, about there being kind of previous versions. You can do things like put in an old identifier and find the, the updated version. There are comparative genomics 
endpoints. So these will get you gene trees, homologs, alignments. Um, so you can see where I'm showing you these. So we have the header. Um, we have this kind of column that says resource, which is kind of the name of it, the thing that you actually use, and then the description that says actually what you're getting um, and what you're getting it from. And they're all listed in this format. They're either get or post. And then they have sort of words separated, uh, terms separated by slashes. And some of them have, as you can see here, a colon in front of them. And so these are the parameters. So we have comparative genomics. Uh, we have cross references. So you can look up other IDs in Ensemble and find other IDs that are attached to Ensemble objects. So some of these, um, so this symbol, species symbol, this you put in a gene symbol and you can get all of the other databases that talk about it. You can put in an identifier from RefSeq. Uh, so this one, xref slash ID. Here you can put in, um, sorry, this one you put in an Ensemble identifier. This one you put in an identifier from another database and it finds you the ensemble. Got information, this is loads of stuff about current release. Um, and this is the section where you would find the, the current version that you're working with. Um, you can get linkage to Sequilibrium. You can find ensemble objects. So this is essentially you just put in either an ID or a, a, a symbol. Um, you can map coordinates, so you can map between cDNA and region and coding region. Um, you can map between two different uh, genome assemblies. So this can be really useful. You can map um, protein coordinates as well. So if you had like the coordinates of a, um, a protein domain, you could then map that to the genomic region that that protein domain is found upon. Um, you've got ontologies and tap taxonomy so you um you can map these kind of hierarchical relationships um there's overlap so this is really useful you can find um things that overlap other stuff so you could find everything within a genomic region so all the genes in a genomic region all the variants in a genomic region all of the promoters in a genomic region you can find variants in a gene or a protein you can find domains in a protein um, so you've got lots of options um, available here. And once we um, go in and start to click through, you'll see that there are loads and loads of options. You can get phenotypes. So you can get genes and variants linked to phenotypes. So these ones that say um, phenotype term allows you to put in a phenotype and it will get you back the genes and the variants associated. Or you can go the other way. You can put in um, a gene and get the phenotypes linked to the gene, which is quite cool. Um, you can get details of microarrays, you can find details of epigenomes um, and regulatory features. You can get sequences of identifiers and regions of both nucleotide and amino acids. Um, you can get haplotypes from real individuals. Um, some of you may have heard of the variant effect predictor, um, and this is available as a, a REST tool. So this will allow you to get variant consequences on um, genes and transcripts. And so you can put in variants in different formats, such as HGVS, um, variant identifiers, um, or this sort of region allele is more kind of BCF style. You can find out information about known variants. Um, and so there's loads and loads of stuff that you can get through this. So let's have a look at how this documentation is actually structured. Um, and how we use it. So if I go um, into da, 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 one of these, so I'm going to go into, I mentioned about the um, version. Um, so if you, this uh, get info rest one here, you can just use this one. So what you, what you do essentially, sorry, that's the software version. Where's the one that I want? Um, It can sometimes get a bit um, difficult to see which um, ah info rest no that's not the right one info software yes gets you the current release of ensemble so essentially what you're doing with this so I've got get info slash software so if I put in 
into a URL. Rest on ensemble helps if I can type dot org slash info slash software. It tells me that the current release is 104. And so that's that's what that's doing. So let's go back here and I'm going to use go into one of these lookup um, ID endpoints. So this is get lookup slash ID. Um, and then it's got this colon ID. So essentially, if we go back to this, you put in rest.ensemble.org, then you put in slash, and then you put whatever's here. And this is, so you're basically creating a URL that you, um, you, you run a query with. So you put in here, so you put in whatever's listed here. So it's um, lookup slash ID slash, and then where we've got this colon thing, this is a required parameter. So this is a piece of data um, this is actually the thing that we want to query for. So this is kind of this part that's not got the, the colons um, is kind of your endpoint. This is saying this is the type of query that I want to do. And this bit here is where you say, and this is what I want to query for. So in this case, you want to put in an ensemble stable identifier. It's listed further down here under required um, parameters. So I'll just copy the example value from there. And I think it's actually what's already there. And when I put this in, let's just make that bigger. You can see that I get data. Um, so it's immediately given me um, data about this gene. Um, it's giving me its description and it's all in this kind of keys and values. So we can see, um, and these are just listed alphabetically. So they're not, they're not in a kind of order based on on priority or anything like that. So I can see I've got things like the display name um, and useful information like that. Um, so I, I've got it all labeled. I know what information is what. And because it's completely plain text, that means it's computer readable, which is really useful. Oh, and now this is horrible and giant um, because I zoomed in on that. So you have your required parameters. So these are the things that you have to include or um, it, won't, it won't do anything. You also have optional parameters. So these are things that I can add um, to get further information if I want to. So I'm gonna add, so what you can do is you can say at the end of this, I can put question mark and then I can write the name of one of these um, optional parameters so I can put expand and then this is a boolean so it gives you the description here it says this is boolean you either put zero or one by default it's on zero so if i want to change this if i put expand equals one and now run it you can see i've got loads of extra information so this expands the search to include connected features um, so if it's a gene it gives you the transcripts translations and x on so you can see I've now got all this information in my output as well as what I had before. If I want to do multiple ones of these, um, so let's let's add phenotypes as well. I know that there's some phenotypes, so I can add a, a semicolon and I can add more um, things. So now somewhere in here, it's going to be a nightmare to find it because it's going to be really long. Oh, got more exons. Here we go. We've got some orphan nets and cancer gene atlas, cancer gene set, census, etc. So now we've got loads more information. Um, I can also change how it displays. So I've got these response formats here. Um, so it's currently giving it me in a in a plain text. But let's say I want to see it in um, JSON. I can add um, content, and I bet I typed this wrong, equals application slash JSON. And now it's giving me in a slightly different format. So JSON is a, is a kind of standard key value um, format that is very, very computer readable. Um, and in some of the endpoints, you'll see that you get 
options. Um, so if I go back to where's sequence, if I go to sequence, I can get things like fast day um, as my as my format, um, which obviously you might want to do for that. Um, so if I look further down this page, you can also see we have example requests. So this is giving um, giving me sort of ways that I might put this in. And if I click on this to open it in a new tab, it gives me the full URL with the rest on somewhere.org at the beginning. So this is this is a completely working query. I can open it in a new tab. Um, this one further down. So this one's got a whole bunch of um, optional um parameters added so this one is one that has got content type is fast a so you can see this has come out as fast a which is quite nice so you can see there's loads and loads of um things that you can do do just with a single endpoint the other thing that's listed in this um page of documentation so here i've got example output so this is exactly what i can see well no this one is exactly what I can see on this tab that I've opened here. But I can also click on um, these buttons with programming language names and it gives me code. Um, so all of this is working code. I could run this code in the respective um, in the respective code type. So I could do um, I could run this with Python 3. I could run this with Ruby and I would again get this as my output. Um, and it all works. I could do a wget, so I could just show you this one. So I could just copy this and put this in my terminal, and I get it in my terminal as well. So it all completely works, um, which is quite nice. So this is the first part of what you're getting kind of in your documentation. Um, so you've got your your required parameter anything that's got this um colon you have to include this so this this goes into your url this colon goes into your url and you've got a description of what that means and these are all things that you can choose to add as well if you think these would be useful you've got your sample code so um Yes, as I've shown you, the easiest way to make REST calls is to put them into the browser. So you can do this to kind of quickly look stuff up. You can test URLs to see if they work, what the, if you use the correct parameters, what the output looks like. Um, there's one that's quite useful um, called ping. I'll just show you ping. If you're running a script that kind of accesses lots of stuff, um, I recommend sticking a ping at the beginning of it and saying that if um, ping doesn't work, you fail. This basically checks that you've got a connection. If you get one, it means your connection's worked and everything's fine and you can carry on and do everything else. Um, if you don't get one, it's not worked. So here's the query that we did, um, we sort of looked at before. Um, so you've got this kind of rest on somebody.org is your server. You've got this, this endpoint with its required parameter, and you've got this optional parameter here. We also give you status codes. Um, so if you send something to our server that doesn't work, you will get error messages. So um, 200 is the, error, is the code you want. That means request was a success. Anything that starts with a four is usually something has gone wrong on your end. Um, so 400 usually means there's a mistake in your um, the ID. So if we go back to here, it's probably there's a typo in this part. Um, so the parameters, the, the required parameters you put in. 403 might be if you've hit our rate limits and 404 is probably a typo in this part. Um, so you've made an error, you've put lock up instead of look up or something like that. Um, 408 is a, is a delay um, and 429 is, is too many requests. We do have rate limits. 500 is something on our end, um, could be something's broken. 
503. So if you do get that, you can send us an email and tell us it's broken. Try another time if it's still broken, come back um, and drop us an email. So you can also script around um, REST API calls, and I showed you a bit of that in the um, in those um, example codes. So this allows you to extract specific bits of data from your REST API call, output in preferred format, link calls together so you can make really complex queries and integrate these into larger pipelines. Um, they are language agnostic. REST APIs can be accessed with any language, any coding language that you can use. Um, so you can call and you can decode with any script. What you'll get out if you get JSON format back is essentially um, like a dictionary um, that you can query. We have examples in, um, in our training courses in Python and R. There's also examples on the pages in, in Perl and Ruby and JavaScript um, and C. Um, there are two methods. So you can have get methods where you essentially have an ID in the URL. You have post methods where you have like a separate object um, called IDs where you put in a list. Or it could be called IDs or it could be called something else, it depends, and you put in a list. So these can be really useful. So I want to show you some scripts where this works. So um, also linked from this, this training page that I've got here is a Jupyter notebook. Um, and this is this Jupyter notebook here. Um, and this is the sample, this is some sample code. Um, I've got some code in here in Python and R, and I just want to show you kind of what we've got here and, and what it does. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how you write these scripts. Um, so this uses a, this Python script uses a package called requests, um, which basically allows you to query REST API. These, um, so we've got a, a sort of subroutine here called fetch endpoint that uses the request package it checks um, the status and if you get a, an error message it gives you back the error message otherwise it carries on and it decodes the data so what this does is it's we've got a gene defined um, i've created so i've actually used this sequence id um, endpoint so it's using this sequence slash id slash um, where'd it go so I've got it saying sequence slash ID and then a gene ID, which I've defined as an object. It runs this, um, this subroutine, it's getting data as fast A and it's gonna print it for me. So I can just run this, perfectly welcome to um, use these Jupyter notebooks to copy whatever you like out of them um, for your own script. So you can see here, I've down that this is a really long bit of um, sequence I've got here. Um, and I'm never going to get out of it. There we go. Um, so that's downloaded some sequence. I've got a, the script that does exactly the same thing in R. So if you do work in R, um, you can run it this way. Ah, I haven't run my cell magic. So I just run that at the beginning and that will then allow me to run our code in this same Jupyter notebook. So you can see we've got it working in R as well. I'm not going to go through detail of how we use this. And we've also got some examples with um, post. So this is where we put in a list. So we've got another kind of, we're still using this requests package. We've got another subroutine um, that uses post. We put in a gene name. It's going to do this lookup endpoint so this we looked at where'd it go so this is doing um sorry not the lookup id lookup symbol so this is lookup slash species lookup slash symbol and then species and symbol so we've put that in there so we're saying homo sapiens and gene name and i've included this expand equals one option that we saw earlier, which allows you to pull back out transcripts. 
I've got a bit here that finds all the transcript identifiers and then turns this into a list, which it then runs with the sequence ID um, endpoint and gets prints out all of the sequences of all of them for me. Jupyter Notebook's are lovely. So now you can see I've got all of these transcript um, sequences. Um, if I scroll up in here, you will see that I get fast day. Here we go, there's a fast day header. Um, so that works in Python. And we also have a working version doing exactly the same thing in R. And you are absolutely free to copy and paste this code into your own. Um... Did I hit run on that? Oh, there we go. Oh, it's printed that funny. Um, sometimes you have to mess about with it a bit to get it to, to print the things you want them to print. Um, we do have rate limiting on our server. So this is to prevent one person from monopoly, monopolizing the resources. Uh, rate limits are by IP address. So if you're in the same institute as somebody else, um, and they're heavily using the data, then you may find that they slow you down. Um, but basically you're allowed 55,000 requests um, an hour, which averages out at about 15 a second. So if you know you're gonna do quite heavy queries, you might want to add some weight steps in. Um, if you found this really useful, then, um, and you think this is something you would like to know more about, um, we do, have a sort of much, much longer version, um, a longer course which uses Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so this is available online. Um, this is completely free through EBI Train Online. Um, it will take you the best part of a day. Um, so it's not a small commitment. Um, but if you, you're interested in that, you can use that. You can also just use it to, to steal bits of code um, from us. We can also do um, live courses at the moment. They're all virtual, but at some point we might um, travel and, and do them in person again. We will teach at any institute for free. Obviously, when we're in person, there are expenses and we do request those from um, institutes in, in high income countries. If you are interested in this, you can email us or um, visit training.onsumble.org slash hosting. I'll just put that link to, um, this is the full REST API course here. So um, if you enter this course, you'll see, it, I don't know why it says one hour, it's definitely more than one hour. Um, this kind of goes through the Jupyter notebooks that it uses. Um, and um, there's a little presentation that's pretty much the same thing that I've just given you here. Um, and then you can go into the Jupyter Notebooks, which will walk you through this. So go back to the course overview and put that into the chat box. So this is definitely a, a whistle stop tour, but if you want to have the full version, then that online course or the in-person courses, um, we'll really go into detail on doing this and get give you opportunities to practice um, writing these sorts of scripts. <coughs> Excuse me. If you are working with our REST APIs or any of our data, you can um, drop us an email, help desk out on somebody.org. There's also our developer mailing list um, if it's a really squishy technical um, problem. Otherwise, you can check out our release notes. Um, you can follow us on social media. We do talk about updates um, to our APIs um, via social media when things change. Um, so we recently had a change in how we present data on our EQTL endpoints. So that required, there was a blog post about that um, in case anybody had scripts that used them that needed to be um, updated. This was our team the last time we were actually all allowed to be together. Um, and actually all the, the names of the people. And these are our funders to whom we are incredibly grateful. Thanks for coming.